Well, hello to everyone in our audience, uh, and especially to those in our virtual cinema. Uh, my name is Duncan Dykes, and welcome to day two of Doc Edge 2022. I hope you're enjoying the festival so far. Uh, we have here in Q&A, Stefan Moore and Dan Goldberg, co-producers of The Bowerville Murders. Uh, Stefan, Dan, uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, I'm just going to open with a couple of questions, uh, and then we'll throw it to the audience. So if you're in the audience, uh, take this time to try and think of some, some good questions for our guests. Um, my first question, um, how did you guys first uh, encounter this story, and how long did you guys stay with it? Oh, well, I'll begin taking a shot at that. Um, I, I originally uh, knew about this story uh, because I had uh, produced a public affairs a current affairs piece um, in uh, 2011 about the families uh, for a uh, current affairs show called Four Corners over here. And um, it was about their situation and about uh, at the time and um, their ongoing battle to uh, have their case be heard and the uh, alleged perpetrator be retried. And then in 2016, the Attorney General of New South Wales sent this case forward to the Criminal Court of Appeal for it to be retried. And we never thought that would happen. Dan, who had been following the case, uh, you know, as it evolved, um, heard about it at the same time. And um, it, was just, uh, it was just serendipity that we both uh, were doing it and we both met at that time and decided we had a common vision and began to work on it together. That's fantastic. And so uh, is that also how you met Alan, the director? Yes, well, uh, Alan, we, we reached out to Alan very early on. This is uh, an indigenous film and it, it was key that we had uh, an indigenous uh, key creative, a director. And, um, uh, Alan originally was working on some other things and, you know, he eventually, but he eventually uh, came on. And uh, by the time we got to uh, the uh, main filming up in Barrowville, uh, he was with us. So uh, Dan and I had managed to follow the families through the court system uh, roughly from 2016 through 2019. And then um, Alan was able to come on and do the main shoot. Hmm. Now, uh, making this film must have required a lot of trust from the community that you're depicting. Can you speak at all to the involvement that the families had in the making of the film? Um, yeah, so um, look, Stefan has had a 10 plus year relationship with the family since he did Four Corners in 2011. Um, and then we've joined forces in 2015, 16. So um, we've been with them five years, he's been with them 10 years and 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 it's a process. Uh, there's no um, easy way to tell this story and the families, you know, we very much wanted the families to understand from our side that yeah, this would be a re-traumatizing process. I mean, we were going through 30 years of trauma um, in a, a case that hasn't been solved and their children, three children are murdered. Um, so building trust was a gradual, a real gradual thing. And, and the more time we spent on the ground in Barraville with the families and in the courts, um, we, we, we gradually built that. And of course, um, Alan, um, was pivotal to that as well. Um, and all of the long, long interviews we did with the family members were, were, were really quite uh, obviously harrowing um, for for them to re-rake through what they'd been through. Um, but we, we very much um, wanted the film to be in the voice, in their voice. Um, so there's no narration as you would uh, have seen when you watch the film. And it's very much their voices. And that was uh, critical from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I'd, say, I'd say that the families as well um, uh, were made participants in the process uh, 
from the very beginning. And it was an understanding that uh, we would move forward with them, uh, not just as filming subjects, but as participants in the process. And um, uh, I think that was key and they felt that way. And, 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 and they were participants through production and through the editing process as well. So uh, um, it was a very, very close relationship. And as Dan says, a very fraught one for the families because they were, you know, uh, when we showed them the final film and for their comments, which we took on board, they were reliving 30 years of agonizing history. Mm. And, and that really reads in some of the, the interview scenes that you guys have, they're incredibly emotionally impactful. Um, now with telling a story that's obviously this, uh, this much of a, a real pain for uh, the people in the film, what would you guys say were some of the biggest responsibilities that you felt in telling this story, a story about such a sensitive subject? Uh, look, their 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 emotional well being. Um, you know, there are uh, a lot of family members, and and there's three families, and they all have generations, uh, and it's intergenerational trauma. Um, so uh, you saw in the film Marbuck and Elijah, the two uh, young fellas. Um, they weren't even born when the murders took place but they were born into the trauma and the trauma has been passed through the generations. And so um, our overarching concern was uh, we knew that by dint of making this film and the families agreed to it, but we knew that there would be um, a lot of trauma involved. And our concern was to make sure that, you know, they were okay along the journey. I should add that uh, we, we had, uh, a, a, a mental health nurse from the Aboriginal Health Services who became quite close to the production. He was actually our fixer as well, um, who was with us the entire time and knew these families over a 10 year period, knew their stories, knew their traumas, knew uh, what they experienced day to day intimately. And um, he was an invaluable uh, source for us and for the families. And, um, and, 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 uh, that had to be part of the process. I mean, this, you know, this, uh, 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 you know, real concern of re-traumatizing uh, family members was with us at every moment. Hmm. Well, I think at this point, I'll, I'll throw to the audience for, for additional questions. Um, if you're in our virtual hub, then if you type in a type in a comment, we'll be able to bring it up on screen over here. Um, just as we're getting questions in, uh, I'll just say um, the film, uh, you guys had a quite unique position with the film where you were able to depict and even engage with uh, one of the key suspects in this case. How would you guys say you navigated that, which is obviously a very uh, delicate and complicated sort of situation? Well, <laughs> it it was, it, you know, we uh, reached out to the suspect uh, numerous times um, throughout the production uh, and his family and people who knew him to uh, get them to participate in the production. And uh, we were unsuccessful. Um, however, fortunately, uh, the journalist who's featured in the film, Dan Box, um, did uh, a podcast that received, I mean, just massive uh, uh, numbers of people watching it, through, uh, listening to it around the world. Um, and he uh, managed to get the only known interview, uh, recorded interview with the suspect, uh, alleged suspect. And um, that became that material that you see in the film became um, the, you know, our, our, our key, uh, he became the key voice for uh, the other side of the story 
So, and it, it, but uh, we were we we were uh, unsuccessful in reaching him directly ourselves. Mm. Um, just another question before our audience questions come in. Um, if there's one thing that you guys hope an audience would take away from with this film, uh, one impact you hope to have on viewers, um, can you speak to what what that is? What you hope an audience leaves with? Uh, look, on the face of it, it's a film about the murder of three Aboriginal children, but we and actually the network over here who broadcast the SBS, um, we're always committed from the start to um, make sure that we were actually telling a macro story as well. And it's really an essay on racism in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, racism filters throughout the whole 30 years of this process uh, uh, and and I, I suspect that your viewers over in New Zealand uh, have a different perspective because your race relations are are so different um, and we are so far behind you I think in in where we're at with with reconciliation and with our relations with First Nations um, but I would hope that um, people would watch it and and just feel outraged that in 2022 we're still on this side of the ditch where we are and and i often look across the ditch to where you guys are and maybe it's through rose-colored spectacles but um we've got a long way to go hmm. we've got our first question from the audience um from alex how's the film being distributed or exhibited in australia are you guys able to get the message across across the country over there Over to you. Well, it's it was um, broadcast on SBS. It's currently available on SBS on demand. Um, uh, we have an international distributor um, who's selling it um, to networks across the world, and I'm sure including New Zealand. Um, and it's featured at film festivals uh, around the world. It um, it won an award in in the um, in the South Pacific, FIFA, the, in the um, FIFA Film Festival in Tahiti, um, <laughs> and it's slowly making its way. But obviously, as, as you guys would appreciate, it was released right in the middle of lockdown mm. here in Australia. Mm. So it was uh, the premiere was at the Sydney Film Festival, but the <clears> Sydney <throat> Film Festival last year was online only. So um, mm. COVID uh, did not help the distribution, but it does have... Uh, an international distributor and it is being aired in various networks. Well, we, we did have a mm. screening, just to remind you, we, we did have a screening at the... Uh, Nambaka. Uh, well, no, we had a screening in, Sydney. Uh, in Sydney, yeah. actually. The, delayed the, the, screening. The delayed screening. So we, we had a whole rollout plan for the film, which was going to be the Sydney Film Festival premiere, followed by the broadcast, as it turned out, because the Sydney Film Festival was way late. We had the broadcast first, and then... The Sydney Film Festival, which normally doesn't agree to uh, <clears throat> exhibiting films that have been broadcast, agreed to uh, 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 have the film exhibited anyway. Anyway, it all it all turned out okay, but it wasn't mm -hmm. exactly the, the kind of uh, release we had in mind. I can imagine. Um, we have another question from Rachel. Um, has anything happened since the film was completed? Any updates to the case or to these people's lives? Uh, well, as you see in the film, the, the, the last um, uh, part of the story was in the High Court of Australia, and um, they agreed with the lower court in New South Wales, the Supreme Court in New South Wales, that um, the... Uh, Chart that that um, there wasn't there were no grounds to reopen the case and retry the alleged suspect. Um, subsequently, uh, the only uh, key thing that's happened uh, that, that I can think of is that the New South Wales Police increased the reward from one million dollars to three million dollars for any information leading to a conviction. Now. <clears throat> This only applies to the Colleen Walker case because, uh, as you've seen in the film, the other two cases uh, had both been, the, the alleged suspect had been tried for the murder of the other two uh, 
uh, for um, uh, Clinton's Speedy and Evelyn Greenup. So, uh, uh, so that the only new information that could come out that could reopen the case would be in relation to Colleen Walker, whose murder has, has never been tried. So that's the one big thing that's happened subsequently. Um, but there's been uh, no uh, news about anybody coming forward as yet. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a question from Lynn, uh, which again is, how did you find the story? If you could maybe uh, speak to how you uh, first encountered the story, at, I believe it was Dan who was with it from uh, quite early days, uh, it sounded like. It was Stefan who um, Sorry, followed that um, in 2011, 2010, uh, Four Corners. And, um, and then really for me, um, it was uh, the podcast by Dan Box in 2015, 16. I want to say, um, which is still online. And, and for those out there who um, are looking for podcasts, it's called Barravo. And it, 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 I listened to it and pretty much picked up the phone at the end of the six parts and phoned Dan Box and said, that's an unbelievable story. Uh, we should make a documentary. Mm -hmm. and, and subsequently met Stefan and we did. Um, so really, um, I, I do... I do have to go back to that moment where I just listened to all the episodes in a binge and saw a documentary in front of my eyes. Yeah, and uh, mm. I had contacted Dan Box about a week before Dan did, uh, just saying, you know, uh, you know, and I was aware he did the seminal podcast on this uh, uh, story and, and, and um, just to let him know that, you know, uh, I was interested in pursuing a documentary. And he said, you know, there's some other guy who's interested in making a documentary. I said, oh, really? I said, you know, with a little trepidation, who's this guy? And uh, well, we got in touch and it turned out to be a marriage made in heaven, really, because mm. as I said, we, we both shared so strongly a common vision in this film. Mm, that's a that's a very interesting story as well. That uh, Dan essentially ended up playing matchmaker uh, and putting you guys in touch yeah, with each other. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've got a question here from uh, Dan, which is, "What was the most challenging thing for you personally in making this film?" Uh, uh, well, uh, just briefly from my end, uh, I mean, I I think uh, going back to dealing with families who have had this extraordinary trauma uh, in their lives and, and, and engaging with them in a way that was honest and <clears throat> allowed them to express themselves was um, incredibly challenging. I, I, I came back from some of these meetings with the families uh, early on and I, I was shaking, I, you know, just having heard their stories and engaged with their pain. And I came back to the guy who was the, um, <clears throat> the uh, mental health nurse that I told you we were working with. And, I, and he said, you know, uh, this, you can't not be in, you can't not be engaged with this story at this level. If you're going to deal with these families, uh, you know, that basically you are experiencing, what did he call it? Um, uh, 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 trauma by proxy is what he called it. Mm. You know, that's, and that's, and I think both of us really experienced that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we have a question here from Alex, uh, which is, have you had any screenings with the community? And I guess as a larger question, are you guys still in contact with the people depicted in the film? Yeah, we had uh, a screening up uh, right around the corner from Bairavu, um in a place called Nambaka um, when the film was released and the families came. And, you know... You, we spend five years making this film and then all of a sudden it's on a big screen and the families are there and there's, you know, lots of other people there. And there was a Q&A &A at the end like this, except in person. 
And the most mm. um, startling thing was the amount of people who got up. I remember especially one uh, elderly lady um, who got up and, and she just said, you know, she was very emotional and she just said she was just so ashamed that this had happened uh, in her backyard and in her time. And, so and this was a white, a white woman. Yeah, a, a, a white woman who uh, lived in the area and knew about it. But it was just, it was a deeply uh, emotional screening for obvious reasons. We were right there um, mm -hmm. next to the scene of the crimes. Uh, but the 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 audience um, at the end just, yeah, there was just, a, it was an emotionally charged uh, Q and A. Yeah, I mean, I, I know we both had, um, we were both pretty nervous about, you know, show, showing this film on a big screen in front of uh, the community and the, and the families in particular. And, um, and, and seeing it, you know, because I think that was the first time we actually saw it on a big screen. Yeah, yeah. because of COVID. And um, it affected us. So we can imagine... You know how it affected the families as well. Who most all the key family members had seen it. We'd shown it to all of the family members in the process of in the in the course of editing a, a few times. So um, they were. But again, you know, seeing it on a big screen in a public theater is something else. Mm. Uh, well, we have a question from Christian. Um, are you working on any new projects? I guess considering the two of you met very specifically in the course of making this film, are you guys gonna uh, go as a pair to anything else? Uh, we have been, uh, look, we are doing uh, other projects for various networks, but there's one project that we might collaborate on again. It revolves around um, a fascinating uh, story set in uh, World War II. Um, it's a Holocaust story. A Holocaust story. And um, without going into it in too much detail, it uh, is in development um, and we're just trying to get it commissioned. Um, and we're, I think we're up for one more. <laughs> Maybe. But this guy's working on so many things, I can't keep up with him. But, you know, he's, he, he is, he's juggling a million things. So, yeah. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have the time for today. Um, now, uh, for those of you in our uh, in our audience, the film is available online uh, until the uh, the tenth of July, uh, and it really is fantastic. So, if you haven't had the chance to see it yet, then you absolutely should. Uh, there's also online. There's more than a hundred other fantastic documentaries, really worth checking out. Um, and for those of you in our virtual hub, our exhibitions will stay open for another hour. So, we really suggest checking those out as well. Um, otherwise, Stefan, Dan, once again, thank you guys so much for joining us uh, and congratulations on the film. It's incredibly, incredibly impactful. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much.